Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Regen Civics. Um, we've got a lot to cover today. Um, but first, I actually wanted to share with you all something. Last week, we were talking about a study that was done that kind of um, erodes the concept of work and play and what that actually means. So again, they're going around and studying the working hours of cultures and how many hours they needed to work in order to meet all of their needs. And they found one. Um, they didn't even have this concept of work. So it was hard to track what actually work was. So we shared that last week. But anyway, I didn't tell you the results of the study. What's hilarious is that it showed that they only needed to work about 15 to 20 hours a week to meet all of their needs. And the rest of their time they could devote to leisure, you know, and the harshest climate on the planet. So I think that's kind of funny and hilarious. Um, when we talk about our civilization and what direction it's going, but also at the heart of our new cultures and how we're designing them, because we can be designing them to be much more efficient and effective at how we meet our needs, right? Um, all right, so before I kick off today, I would love to know if there's any announcements or anything anyone wants to share. Well, I have one thing uh, just to respond to that. It's like also like reframing what work is, right? Like like so much of what we do, it's like we fucking love, you know, this is the thing that like brings us life and energy and like passion and to, to not be in the process of doing that, to not be here to share that with ourselves and our family and everybody else is like actually depriving them of what that feels like to be so connected and desirous and excited to do the things that we're doing, so. That takes more than 15 to 20 hours a week for me, but I love doing it. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, I'm going to prevent myself from waxing lyrical too long on that. Um, because today's session, we're going to be passing it to Nico, um, if he is ready for it. So you can give me a thumbs up if whenever you are ready, Nico, um, to go over something that they've been working on for the last several years is their master plan. So we've been talking about some artifacts that we're creating in Regen Civics. Artifacts being, you know, physical and digital creations that we're creating as our communities to help other members, you know, understand what we're doing. So one of them was the game guide, and we'll talk about that more in the upcoming weeks. Um, but the one that we're going to be showing right now is called the master plan. So this is kind of showing all of the flows and all of the relationships within your culture, community project, whatever it is. So that's the general theme here is we're trying to track all the flows and all the relationships and how those things all connect with each other. So to ground that and to give you a little bit more clarity on what this means and to show you a template that Nico created, which my last announcement will be, I'm looking for all of the Alliance organizations to start joining the Region Civics Do so we can start acknowledging all of these templates and tools and resources that all of you have been creating. So that's another function of the Regen Civics organization itself is to acknowledge all of the tools and resources and contributions that got us here. So for example, this template Nico's showing, I would love to actually demonstrate us going through a process of him putting up a proposal because he made this available for the community to be compensated for that and recognized and tokens, right? Um, but anyway, that's carrying on. So Nico, are you ready? Yeah. Um would you like me to go through um, the project itself as well, or just dive into the thing that we make? Um, maybe a little bit of both, just a quick overview of the project, um, maybe literally like two, three minutes, and then start going over the master plan, the general theme of the master plan, and then each kind of one of the sections. Okay. Um, well, so I'll, that people, they can you know, benefit from actually looking at it, playing with uh, it. Cool, I'll play through it. I'll fly through this. Um, so just as a general overview and a reminder, La Tierra is a regenerative village we're building in Costa Rica. It's 430 acres of land. Um, basically, it's a mix of um, residential um, think tank, regenerative movement, school of sorts. So like kind of like if you if you were to redesign SLN in the 21st century, it would be something like this. Like as a retreat center experience, uh, etc. Um, we're gonna have an experience, very strong experiential artistic component. So like a Burning Man, uh, but permanent uh, with a festival ground, and the entire place will be designed for transformational experiences based on like experience design and performance. Um, and then you will also have a hotel and, and like restaurants and and a few other features. Um, one of the I think innovative things is this idea that we had uh, called Mycelia which is um, 
inspired by Burning Man and how they build an entire city in a week, we thought, you know, we would love to be this decentralized, more open thing that is not just one thing that we're holding. And so we came up with this idea of creating a 20 to 40 acres of the 400 that we have. We're going to open up to communities that are looking for land to build their villages. And so we're going to remove all the hassle that usually they need to go through in like finding land, going through the legal permits, acquiring the land, building, and all those things most of these communities don't know how to do. And so we're going to do for them. We're going to set up the entire infrastructure. We're going to get it like build ready. And we're going to build for them if that's what they want. Otherwise, they can just find different constructors. But we're going to have all the biophilic architecture, really well thought design, et cetera, available to them. And so we're going to invite 10 to 14 communities that are looking for you know between one acre to 10 acres of land to come and build their villages. And what this will create is a village of villages. And so overall, you're going to have a town that has many different offerings. And some of these villages will be focused on like maybe yoga. Some of them might be more focused on circus and fire spinning. Some of them might be more tech driven. Um, so the idea is that we can have this diversity. Um, we're going to be working all like with biophilic concepts. It's going to be one of the most sustainable projects. Uh, we're going to have a lot of bylaws to enforce sustainability of everything that is built. Um, the Agora is more of the, like the, as I said, the think tank component. We're going to have, we, we hope to be one of the, the, the headquarters of the regenerative movement. And through the work that we do in Design Science Studio and, and all the things with the Bagnus Fuller Bagn Institute, we're going to really create a space where the entire regenerative movement has a space to just think together and design together and, and meet and, and use the entire project as a, a way to envision what's possible. And then we're going to build two of the villages. Uh, here you have some inspiration images uh, of how we want them to look, but they're going to be highly driven by community and, and designing the spaces to be, you know, highly nourishing and, and, and an example of what can be and different ways to interact and create community, um, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, most of the images that you see are from architects that we're already working with. So it'll, it'll look something similar uh, to that. And then this is the more experiential Burning Man-like uh, outdoors art component. Um, and, and within all of this, we really expect to, you know, create templates that can be replicated as easy as possible. Um, and so, yeah, um, a lot of principles there, a lot of design behind it, uh, a lot of you know, the, this is, for example, this is part of the brand design that we're doing. And the other day I was um, arguing with them uh, because they kept talking about the branding, right? And so we kept, you know, thinking about the branding and the branding. And at some point I stopped there and it's like, no, no, no. What we're creating is uh, a cosmology. Like we're, we're designing new civilizations. So we need to start thinking in those terms. Is how do we create culture? How, how do we make it in a way that you arrive to this land and it feels like you're arriving to a whole new civilization that will show you everything, how, it's, you know, how it can be done differently. Um, and so we're working under those, those parameters of design and working a lot with this idea or concept of, of um, ontological design. Uh, which is basically the idea that everything that we design designs us back, that architecture, lighting, texture, uh, sound, music, experiences, all of that has an impact in how we feel. And all of us are ontological designers. That's why you, you know, buy apartments that have more light. And whenever you're having a bad day, you take a bath. And all those little things that you're doing to nourish your mind and body, all of those are like you're ontologically designing yourself. And so this entire village will be designed to, to change how you feel and how you think. Um, fortunately, we have a land partner that is putting the, his land that he has owned for 20 years into the project. Um, the land is 430 acres, it's in Costa Rica, next to uh, Santa Teresa, we're next to an airport, we have uh, road access, we have a magnificent beach, we have two rivers, um, a waterfall that pours into the ocean, a sweet water lagoon on the beach, um, and a lot of space for like growth. Um, and so our land partner, which will put the land into a project, um, ag agreed to fund um, what you're seeing right here, um, which is what I've been working on for the last 11 months, which is what we, you know, we were up until recently, we're calling it a master plan, but a master plan is more like what I just showed you, like it's just the village layout or like the project layout. This goes way deeper. So we're starting to call it, and we're still like 
accepting ideas for how to define this, but we're calling it a, a village OS, village operative system. It's like this, this is enough information that should allow you to go replicate it somewhere else and have almost all the elements that you might need to fill the village. And so I'll walk you very briefly through this. Uh, this, by the way, is um, just the working mirror that we've been working on to do the information. We're now working with the designers to make it pretty and just, just as a curiosity. So you see how it will um, look once it's finished. Um, this is how, you know, it will, what I'm about to show you will look so much prettier, well designed. We're building like a, a main path that you can follow and then some like secondary paths if you want to expand on the information and, and just finding a way that you can go through all the different villages that we're proposing to build. Uh, you're going to be able to go through the story of place of the land, a lot of information about the land, particularly the environment. How well are we interacting with the environment with like a, a power, electricity, water, uh, sewage systems, etc. You will also find all the different businesses that we're intending to build in here, from like the hotels to the restaurants to the bamboo school, the biophilic uh, furniture store, like all the different ideas that we have. Um, and also a lot of information about this, for example, this I'm happy to share at some point on a single session that I think we should do. And, and we've had conversations around uh, legal structuring. So this is our entire legal structure that we've been working on for about a year. There's a lot to unpack here on how we're structuring the different entities and how the thing is governed and how the the DHO interacts and how all these pieces come together. So really happy, but this requires more time. So if you guys want, we can do like a session only on like this. And that also includes the bylaws that we've been developing with like everything that will regulate what you can build, how to operate in the land. And we're gonna try to make it as little uh, constraining as possible because the idea is to increase diversity and that each village then can have their own governance systems, but we'll have some, some basics on you know, how to build sustainably and how to somehow uh, be in society together. Um, and then, of, of course, this also includes a layer of tokenomics and um, the, the different like ideas for how to, uh, how to regulate all the things through the creation of three different tokens, security token, a utility token, and a governance token, um, and how that interacts with this, which is all the legal structure that I was mentioning, and how we're structuring like a board that will make decisions that is rep has representatives of like many of the stakeholders, and then the how the equity is done. Um, and then here are all the ways in which you can participate. And, also, like we've been developing like whole structures of like, for example, what is the financial strategy that we think could work for similar villages? Um, and you know, how, how would you structure the phases and the different dwellings and how all of these will interact with each other and potential like ways in which you can you can fund this um, uh, through the different structures that are created on the legal entity. Um, and also we've been working on something that um, this piece is particularly, you know, it's been the most difficult to um, pull off. Um, we're about to finish eight months of um, deep, 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 deep numbers. Uh, and so developing, and this is a probably $200 million project uh, if we were to build everything that we want to build. And so here we have like a, like a breakdown unit by unit of like square meters of all the things that we want to develop, infrastructure, roads, parking, um, how much this water costs. And all of these obviously is relative to Costa Rica, but we have built a model in which you can, like there is a lot of things that you can, for example, you can uh, have the project input costs, but also like the, the faces. So you can change here the entire faces of the project in your, the entire spreadsheet and so in here you can say like starting September ending October and it will change the entire spreadsheet to adjust to those dates um, and you can tell like how long each phase will last how many months how will they overlap with each other you can change things like the the for example the sales schedule so you can here uh, put in in here when are you intending to sell each one of the dwellings of the project and that will make distributions through the cash flow so you can see the entire cash flow of the pro of the project understanding when do you need to sell when uh, on each part to just not to, to be cash positive um, so insane amount of work here um, that could eventually be used 
um, and also you know marketing budgets and all the things. Um, but I would say this is a general quick overview of the project. And if you guys have questions, we can, I'd say, go into detail on each particular section um, and I can expand on them. Absolutely epic and insane. Thank you, Nico. Um, so we're going to open it up right now for any questions, thoughts, anything for Nico from any of you. Um, to respond to the first question that was there, if I can put the link. So uh, right now we are 85% done with the um, with the design of this that will be in the pretty version that I showed you at the beginning. Um, I'm not willing to share the working version uh, because it has a lot of like still working version, but in about 10 days, I will have the design version. We won't launch this publicly until like probably in two months, but these two months are gonna serve as a family and friends private access to this document. So you can give us feedback and learn and all the things. So I would say, give me 10 days. I'll share the document in private. I'll ask you for your feedback. You'll be able to put comments and whatever. And then, you know, there's going to be parts of this that we will uh, fully share, share and openly with everybody. There are certain parts that we're going to keep a little bit more private. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to share them. It just means that we're going to select a bit more who we share them with. And, and potentially also there is an opportunity, you know, for partnerships and things that today I was talking, for example, with a, a, an incredible guy who's building a project called Symbiosis in partnership with Singularity University awesome project, super cool. And, and we're like, we, like these projects are so similar and yet not so similar. So an opportunity to partner up, but also like to partner up, to partner up meaning like to maybe get the projects together and build them in the same place. But if that doesn't happen, what we have built is so much, you know, it's so yummy and they could use and save 10 months of work. And their expertise in, is in creating financial structures and like debt financing and things, which is where we're super weak. And so super easy to suddenly partner up and like exchange all the information and help them adapt what we have to their project and the other way around and seeing how, you know, that exchange of services, time, whatever works. Um, but yeah. Which is a, another beautiful way of explaining exactly what we're intending to do here across all of our projects. <laughs> so yes, 100. Um, can I actually offer an upload, I mean, an update to the protocol that you said you'd share it in 10 days? So part of the concept of the do region civics, acknowledging with tokens, people's contributions is to acknowledge and reward them for making it open source and making it so the whole group could use it. So when you do make it available, let's just make that official with the proposal, acknowledge you with tokens, and then we can duplicate that same process. A lot of stuff that is going to be brought into Region Civics might already be open source. But the idea is, is that by making it open source, making it available and integrated with the Region Civics Alliance, meaning you make it like a template, or you make it so it can be templated, then we want to compensate that effort. If you have a piece of software and you integrate that software into the tools that we're using, then that's an integration feature that we're going to compensate people for. So that's kind of what we're trying to do as an alliance is bring all of the tools and resources to all of us so that each one of our projects doesn't have to spend a year and a half doing what Nico did, right? Uh, so that's what's going to help accelerate all of our efforts here across all the different areas we're working and help us start focusing. So what Nico said was, you know, a nice synchronicity to run into him, which by the way, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, we want to create those synchronicities because we can cultivate them. So yeah. if we choose to create our own like specialization as we start seeing other projects and being like, well, Nico's nailed, you know, the ecosystem map plan. Um, maybe I don't need to spend so much time on that because I know other projects are, you know, might be, you know, trying to duplicate that effort. So as we start seeing what other groups are bringing and as we start acknowledging them for those contributions, we can keep specializing where we can really show up in our you know, particular gift and zone of genius, if you will. Um, so anyway, a lot there, but we'll pass it back to the whole group if anyone else has anything for Nico. Um, I see another question there uh, asking about the spreadsheet. Um, I'll, I'll share this <clears throat> vulnerably and also asking for, for feedback. Um, there is... Um, the spreadsheet has been the one that we've been like debating how to do it. I don't think because of the amount of like 
delicate information that it has, um, I don't think we will, it will be one of the pieces that we won't share for, like this master plan will be open, you'll be able to access it. Um, we're gonna think what are the ways in which we can um, open this app, meaning like if you wanna copy the model that we're doing, if you wanna copy the, you know, just go for it. And, and what we're intending to do is, you know, if, if in this process, and we're gonna be hella busy building this thing, but like we're also willing to have more of this. So if in this process, we can uh, at some point be of support to certain projects as advisors or consultants, that's great. But otherwise the entire thing will be there for you to, to do. Uh, with the financial model, which is a little trickier, um, I think what we have more or less agreed to do is to have it in private. So there is a, at least a, like, a, like a step where you need to reach out to us and explain to us why would you like to use it? And I think we're gonna have, you know, depending on the projects, if you're an investor and you're interested, we're gonna send it to you. If you're a, another project where it's just like, obviously you're gonna try to help as much as possible. So we're, we're gonna, just gonna want to know who's gonna have that financial model. And of course, you know, this is the internet. It might filter out at some point and that's okay. Uh, we just wanna be a little bit more mindful and, and know who's, who's accessing those numbers, et cetera, because it's an insane amount of work and, and a lot of investment there but also like something that that really allows you to have a you know a deep insight into how the entire project will work etc um so uh just this world also for investors that might not feel fully comfortable having that out there etc we're just going to be a little bit more mindful but um but yeah but like the, the the ask for help is uh on trying to figure out like i come from a world where like my first project was the first Creative Commons feature film ever made. And we put it out and we put the script out and we put the 140 hours of footage for people to use for free. And we put the project online. So I, I come from a very open environment, but at the same time over the years, like that has created a, always a struggle of like not just finding reciprocity ways in which like all these insane amount of works can then just like be reciprocated in, in different ways and and it also depends on the project right so like if you if any of you guys come and like want to use this pnl i'm super happy to save you two hundred thousand dollars of and 10 months of time if somebody that's coming for a commercial project that wants to make this like a real estate commercial thing and like white label it as a regenerative whatever then i might not be that comfortable um and so we really like it's just trying to find that balance and, and what are the ways in which we can uh open up but also find reciprocity systems like you know ricky was saying with the tokens or things uh, and in ways in which we can also somehow uh you know one of the beautiful things i love about creative commons is that you can have a license for example that allows for free use but as long as it's non-commercial and so it's like, if you want to use it for free, then it needs to have the same license and it needs to be, you know, non-commercial. If you want to use it for commercial purposes, it doesn't mean that you can. It just means you can, you need to come ask and we can come to an agreement. And so just finding ways in which like we, you can have like the lowest denominator to be shared and open and then like different tiers uh, of, you know, depends. But... Um, also, some somebody asking about uh, the the just creating templates. So, for example, for the creation of this mirror board, we did ten design sprints around different areas of the village design. Um, we don't have the resources right now, but we invested a good amount of money and time on creating these templates to design in different aspects of the village. And some of them are incomplete. Some of them we went through them, so they have data already and ideas. Some of them are just the template. Our, in an ideal world, we would have enough resources, meaning some people and some hours to clean them up and create like a, like a village design or village OS template design. So you can run like, let's say 15 design sprints on different areas to come up with something similar to what I just showed you um, and have that be published. So anybody willing to design a village can come and go through the, you know, use the mirror templates and go through the entire process. And then obviously, you know, there is 
as I said, like there's always an opportunity for like having people that will become specialized in helping you do this thing using those templates. So hopefully we'll have, you know, if you want to run them by yourself, that's fine. Uh, but also have people that can just go through you with, you know, through the process with you, uh, which I think is going to be one of the best skills. Like I, I come from a world where I'm a, I'm a design thinker and I'm really good at putting together mural boards and designing systems and making something that makes a hell of a lot of sense. And it's very, uh, detail oriented um so i'm lucky like that but a lot of people aren't and they may have incredible ideas and they just need some structure and so we're, i think we're going to need people who help us think you know who help us like structure our ideas and put them in a way and hopefully these templates can serve as like at least you know what to put where you know we spend months thinking how to make this thing uh, and how to organize the information etc so yeah um <clears throat> inserting uh an announcement then kind of. I would love for there to be a standing quest and I would vote for any of them that helps make these templates. So as projects start showing up, they've created these tools for themselves. So to go through the process of taking that tool and templatizing it. So getting out the information, clearing it up, putting in some questions, et cetera. Um, that process could be compensated through region civics as well. So as we start making templates that are gonna serve this Alliance, that could be a role that exists within region civics itself to be able to help with a lot of projects. So if anyone feels inspired to do that, and or if you're gonna do that anyway with your project, if you're gonna take one of these tools that are brought here and templatize it for yourself to use, then just do a little bit more effort and then get compensated in region civics by making the template shareable and then adding it to our library um, so that other projects can more easily access it. Um, Awesome. And Nico, you're this is you're doing incredible. Thank you. Anything else you want to share or any other questions for Nico? Awesome. Um, then what we're going to do is I know I'm going to have a one on one with you. We already did and recorded that it was full of information. So I'm going to have a second one with you. Um, and then we can share both of those in the region civics discord. So you guys can all follow along and learn some other things as well. That would be very um, practical for your projects. Okay. As an idea, Ricky, uh, just uh, about this idea that I had of um, templatizing the village building process, just a thought that I leave there that I think that over time, this is what region civics needs to be, right? It's like it's an, as an accelerator slash village building school. Um, the more we can, especially in this first cohort, think, you know, what does the second cohort look like? Um, what could, if, and if we have some resources eventually, maybe that's something that we can do as a cohort, it's like, why don't we sit down <clears throat> to design what a, what a design sprint for villages would look like? And we can use many of like the templates that we build as a base and our master plan as a base. And then if we have some financial resources, meaning we can hire maybe one or two people to work on this for two or three months, in this year, eventually, we can create that for the next one and like have the entire template design. So the next cohort can like you each week, you can have a sprint design to go through the templates and then they can do the work on their own. And you just, I don't know, we can, we can do some wild things in there, but just putting it out there. A hundred percent. As far as like putting out the idea of a structure there, I would say that going through that, you know, redesign process is part of like the winter season. Um, when right now I know we're all in kind of summer season, full on building, getting stuff done. So I would say that yes, a hundred percent to what you brought up, Nico, but maybe we're going to do that in like six months or so. Uh, right now we're still kind of letting the emergence unfold and on the edge of that seat. Uh, Jillian, you have your hand up. Is this? Yeah. Yeah. I just would like us to be uh, more in the pattern of uh, giving acknowledgement as we come around the wheel uh, from this and maybe be in the practice collectively of everybody unmuting and expressing because I'm, I'm sure I know I appreciate it. I'm just I don't often say blown away but just really positively impressed you're very grounded and clear and motivated and we really need that in the system I just want to honor you and I'm sure there's other people here who would like to do the same so I wonder if we just unmute and express our appreciation for you thank you Nico yay 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 um, very well with you. Thank you guys. Um, it's a it's an honor to be um, doing these things and to be with such incredible creatures, such as all of you. Like all your projects are incredible, and I feel like you know it's 
it's such an honor that we are able to have these tools and these resources and to share them with one another uh, while we build these projects that will benefit so many. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being in service. Really beautiful. Thank you. Jillian, that was perfect. Thank you for that invitation. If anyone else would like to act on that invitation before we keep going. Then I will. Uh, Nico, yes, uh, deeply appreciative of your willingness and openness to go through this and share these tools. Like it's a huge amount of work. Um, and that extends to everyone here as well, that all of us and our willingness to just show up and kind of throw off the old world ideas of IP and, you know, hold on to ours because we spent so much time and it's mine. Like, it's so beautiful to be letting that go and seeing what could unfold when we actually step into that, uh, knowing that in reality, we're going to get so much more because what's going to be given back if we do this right. And that's what you brought up, Nico, is we need the structures to make sure that reciprocity is in balance. Otherwise, it decays. Um, so we need to create that balance. And that's literally what we're here doing is trying to build the tools and the flows and map the ecosystem so that we ensure that it is equitable and balanced. And we're, you know, you all get it. Thank you, Nico. You're incredible. Um, Anders, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to presence, you know, the, the dozens, if not hundreds of people, you know, that have in, in the essence, like helped co-create that right there. And, uh, and and just holding that and, and knowing that it's been co-created by so many people and to you know, offer that to us, which is then going to be like a mycelium and we're going to get to co-create that with the other people. And so I definitely like witness your past with regard to like your openness and like challenges and struggles you've had, but still that like the desire to like share this and still the desire to know that like open source is is like how we're going to get to this next level of like human evolution and so thanks for holding that strong and co-creating with us I'm really really excited about it y'all are beautiful <clears throat> all right so we can shift gears now so that's the master plan that's another artifact do you are not expected to have a master plan ready before we get to the crowd pooling phase. Uh, the master plan is something that is going to be developed and emerge over time. Like Nico said, if you haven't started one, if you don't already have one of these, it's probably going to take you, you know, a year as well. Probably going to save a lot of time because Nico can provide templates and all the other templates we have for this, of course. Um, but this is something that's going to be an emergent process that needs to be, in my very strong opinion, co-created by the community that's inhabiting them. That's kind of the great irony of a lot of the projects who figured out communities and how to do it is they're all unique. Every book on how to do intentional community is a totally different system. But the same story they all hold is they came together and created a new system as a community. And there was patterns for creating that new system that helped it unfold. Um, so this is the next topic I'm going to bring up is policies. So how do we create our unique cultures is through the process of putting up policies. And what is a policy? A policy is a decision by your culture on one way to go versus another. And it needs to be, again, strong opinion here, between two seemingly positive things. Meaning, a policy, a very good one at least, isn't we are a kind community. Because probably every community wants to have that type of policy. That doesn't differentiate you from other communities, right? Um, so what is a good example of a policy, actually? Um, Tucker brought it up here, but he's not on the call. I was going to call on him. Oh, there he is, actually. Uh, Tucker brought up this question in the Discord. Our game guide is using language that isn't familiar with people, so it might be putting them off, and it's harder for other people to understand it. So should we use more familiar language so that people you know, can understand our game guide and it's more accessible for more people, right? So one perspective is in order for it to be more accessible and for our community to be more open, we want to use language that's really accessible and understandable to the current cultures, right? That seems very sensible, a very logical thing to do. You know, the other side of this, which is where this becomes, you know, attention for a community is when creating cultures, a unique differentiator between unique cultures is unique language. It's how our brains know that this is something unique and allows us to step into a new culture and let go of a different culture. You know, unique language, unique rituals, unique you know, ways of interacting. It needs to be different. That tension between you know, moving from one to another is just part of the tension of joining a new culture. You know, it's stumbling at first, but it's something that we need to acknowledge. 
Okay, so those are there's nothing right or wrong here, but they're unique. So the community needs to come together to say, okay, do we prefer us to use very simple language and prefer you know, us to be very accessible and open to the most number of people? Or do we prefer to focus on our cultural development and making something unique and specially diverse? There's no good or bad, but that decision does need to be made because it's gonna keep coming up in your community. So one of those ways that we can reduce structural conflict in our communities is by making these policies and making them clear. So this is part and parcel of what the do is supposed to do, is then you put up a proposal, you have a you know, discussion around that policy so that when new members come, they can always go back to the proposals and then look at the previous discussion because they might feel the same way. You come in, it's very sensible to have an accessible and open language. You know, they're like, yes, that makes sense. Why aren't we doing that? We're being, you know, exclusive, exclusive, you know, <laughs> and that's not what the new culture is about. But then they can go and they can look at the dialogue and be like, oh yeah, this tension was already brought up. You know, they discussed it. Oh wait, no, these things make sense, et cetera. But you do that for every one of these, you know, divergent points. And this is what's gonna make every one of our projects the unique cultural project that it's going to be and creating that diversity in the world that we're wanting is as we evolve through our project and we make different decisions at each one of these divergent points, we're gonna be making a unique culture that's most expressing the desires and feelings and culture and you know who we are of the people inhabiting each one of those projects. So this is happening, I'm positive, with each one of your projects today and has already been happening. So what this is, why I'm bringing it up today, and I probably could have brought it up sooner, is we need to be tracking these things and creating a place so new members can come and look and see what are the current policies, what's been decided, what culture am I joining, so that we don't have to keep going back and forth and having these conversations over and over, right? So that we can progress and evolve. Um, and the do is a tool and you don't have to use a dual. Whatever your process for decision-making is today, do have one and then start using it for these policies today. So you can start testing out your decision-making process, seeing how that looks and how it feels, you know, and evolving that decision-making process as you inevitably find ways that it can be improved. So all of that work is starting already. So that's my invitation for everyone here um, is to start tracking these policies. Um, and you don't have to try to forethought all of the policies they're going to come up all on their own. But the key is, is to actually, you know, put them up, make them explicit, and then have the discussion around it, and then post an official decision on how your community is approaching that policy. Now, of course, you can always go back and remodify policies. It just takes another proposal, another discussion process, et cetera, can be evolved. But then what's so great about storing the conversation around it is that you, people can go back, look at the conversation, and then they don't have to bring the policy up again if it's already been discussed, whatever their you know, tension was. So I recommend finding a tool, if you don't want to use the do, um, to start tracking this um, today. I will pause there because that was, if there's any feedback, thoughts, questions, or anything about that. Lauren. I was just curious if you have a specific example um, about where we're seeing language or if that's not relevant here, it's okay, but um, curiosity. Just for fun, yes, it's not relevant um, because I'm not trying to come up with a policy for that. <laughs> What's relevant is that we need to be having these discussions and policies, uh, more importantly in your communities to be having them as these things are coming up. Um, but just for fun, we can pass it to Tucker and you can mention this if you want. Yeah, a couple of the language barriers that were coming up were the terms like lamp lighters and anchors and just like a lot of the language specifically in the game guide was a little confusing to some of the older generation that is in our community here at the Tioga community. But yeah, that's that's about it for now. Well, when you share it that way, then it probably doesn't even need to be a policy. <laughs> you know? Every um, Definitely take the game guide that I presented. Please change all the names. Um, I'm not even remotely recommending that you keep those titles. I think it makes way more sense for you to do them in your own language, preferably if you have one, <laughs> and make them culturally relevant to you. Uh, that's the concept of the template, and maybe it'd be better for me to actually go through it and like say, insert role name here and something, um, which is actually what I will do now. 
Um, but yeah, please change all the names for that and probably change a lot of the game guide to make it unique for your culture. I don't, um, I don't actually recommend that for villages directly. That was for a open source um, community building tools. So that's where that game guide was originally created for was for Haifa and Haifa was building tools and, you know, co coordinating a completely different goal than the projects that you guys are all dealing with are coordinating. So I don't recommend that as a one-to-one -one swap. What I'm saying is the questions that were being asked and how they need to be answered was what I was recommending as a template. Is that how people show up and participate in your project, you know, how they decide how they decide, who holds power, what decisions have been made, et cetera. Uh, you need to have all of those mapped out, which is what I'm talking about with these policies as well. So as you as a community go through and decide, you know, this is who we are and this is how we operate. When new members join, they go through the guide and then those things are linked to them. So they can actually get an understanding of who your culture is and how you guys connect. Um, with that being said, I can plant a seed of an idea here is one of the things that you'd need to create as one of your first policies is your communication policies. Meaning how do you, how do you interact with each other? Because most of our projects, they're global projects. So one of the first tensions we're gonna run into is the mixing of all of these cultures. You know, where one culture, it's totally fine to do something and another culture, that's a complete insult, <laughs> you know? And that happens way too frequently. Um, so a base set of like 10 principles of how your community com you know, communicates with each other uh, is incredibly helpful. Um, so for example, a lot of communities want to use nonviolent communication and it has a set of principles, which I highly recommend. Then you say, yes, we're gonna use nonviolent communication in our community and this is the principles for how to communicate using this, you know, communication protocol. Um, so that's the first thing I'd recommend as a community because that's gonna inform everything else because how you communicate with each other is gonna be the core of how you decide all the rest of your processes or all the rest of your policies and how you continue to evolve your community, right? So it's kind of the very first thing you wanna decide as a community is how do we talk to each other, right? And again, having these things is you put them out there and then they can continually be evolved and refined. So please don't try to make it perfect. It's not going to be, but get something there so you can start building on it. And the last thing I'll say about all of this and what we're building is there was someone, someone had a theory that Western cultures are more addicted to exploring because of how they created their maps. So for example, Asian cultures, they had ships that could circumnavigate the globe. So way longer than Western cultures, but they didn't necessarily do it, why not? Anyway, who knows if any of this is true. Point is the theory was, is that the Western maps left blank spaces while the Eastern maps pretended to be complete. So when they didn't see the entire world, that didn't matter. They said, this is our entire world from our perspective. And this was the totality of the map. But when a map was left open, where there's areas that were, weren't explored and that was there present in the map that it encouraged and it was constant asking for people who looked at that map, that oh, that is a place to go explore. Let me go you know, finish this map. So when we're building our guides, leaving blank spaces is an invitation to the community to co-create, to bring new wisdom, to explore there. And you're also saying that we're not, we're not finished here. You know, this is an evolutionary process. So that's also being said when you have blank spaces. So I encourage you to intentionally create those and maybe even leave questions throughout on things that you know aren't finished, but you know you need to explore that as a community. You can leave spaces like that throughout your guide. Um, so I'll pause there and I'll send it to Anders with your hand up. Yeah, I just have a quick reflection on that. and. I guess other people would probably feel in the same way, but there's like this like deep excitement around having all of our cultures laid out in within the same system like this, because it allows us to like search and like toggle through systems and where do we want to be, where do we want to go, where do other people want to be and where do they want to go, what types of cultures do they want to participate in and being able to you know figure out where they want to go based on all of these systems because we're all using the same overall map we don't have to have the same information but just having the same map makes it really really easy for other people to find the best place for them to be 
and maybe a future evolution of what we're doing here. And this is going to be one of the near upcoming episodes is the membership flow. So when people are like, yay, we love your video, we want to sign up, they're going to go through the membership application process. And what questions we're asking in that, you know, the reason we're asking those questions is to help find the right project for them. So as Andrews, as you pointed out, we're going to start creating a diversity of plurality of projects. Then one of our biggest tasks as an alliance is to help filter you know, excitement and energy and everything to the right project. And we're going to be able to do that if we're using, you know, similar tools and similar semantics so that it's really easy to actually index and find out who's doing what, etc. You guys get that. So awesome. Anders, I love all the input. Um, so anything to share about any of that before we move on to the next topic for today? I know there's got to be at least one, so I'm going to hold this space for a time of quiet reflection until someone shares what thoughts and questions you might have. Hey, so I got a quick question. Um, so with, when you say projects you're doing the memberships, but is that if somebody wants to come and be a part of the project, do they have to go through the membership or do they, can they go like, directly to the project um, and just kind of reach out to, say, the community then in a sense? Uh, or, we kind of like again i know we are talking a lot about with templates uh but obviously every project's kind of you know has a little different taste and a different way they onboard and uh bring in let's say investment or more community members so ship before aiming more for you know trying to obviously bundle everything um and, and, and is it case by case scenario for each project Yeah, awesome question. And I think it's a perfect one because it demonstrates another policy. Um, so as a policy in region civics, potentially, uh, we need to make this explicit. Nothing is exclusive, meaning if you're part of the alliance, you don't have to exclusively be anything with the alliance. So no, like you don't have to say membership can only join me if they go through the alliance portal, right? Um, so absolutely project or people can reach out to your project directly. Um, we don't wanna hinder that or block that in any way. The alliance is just here sharing like, hey, this is what the alliance is doing when we're doing that shared storytelling. When those storytelling materials are going out there, i.e. the YouTube videos we're making and the other platforms we're putting them on. Uh, when people sign up for that being like, yes, we love this whole alliance concept itself. We love the Renaissance itself. We don't necessarily know what project we want to be part of, but we know we want to be a part of this. That's kind of the portal we're building is that they can then apply. And this is for creating new projects. So maybe a project doesn't exist that's right for them, or you know, we're getting so much attention that we're going to be having to launch more projects, right? You know, part of the other of this is putting people into cohorts. Um, so this is the other work we're going to be having to do is find out what is the right cohort. You know, how do we match people together that might have greater success in starting a project? Because I know personally, a lot of people who have a desire to do this, they don't have a community yet that they already know of people that they are love and connected with that just doesn't exist for them yet. Um, so that's part of an offering that we can start bringing to is helping pair people together and then give them the templates they need to go and launch one of their own projects. Um, and that seems to be what a lot of our first 13 projects are doing is they're all looking at this as kind of like a replicable model where you can launch the first of your projects, but then people might be able to reach out to you and through an advisory model, maybe you even kickstart them. They come to your project actually, and there's a fee paid for them to learn from you directly and you prepare them to go and launch a village just like yours. And that could be something facilitated by the Alliance. So when people come together, they're like, yep, this is a group of people. They're awesome. They signaled that they love the Liminal Village concept, you know, and Liminal Village is offering you know, some of these, you know, accelerator incubators, whatever we're calling it, then they can go to Liminal Village and actually learn from them, duplicate their model, and that could be a value exchange. Um, we can place there. Um, so that's a lot of different ways. Perfect. That it's Thank you for 
Yeah, yeah, you you answered a lot of the questions. I think I uh, appreciate giving some of the design structure on, on how we all kind of keep flowing and weaving together. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for cutting me off too. That was all right, mate. way too long. <laughs> uh, any other questions? That's before we keep going. All right, well, I want to hear from all of you a little bit more. So this next section, I wanna open it up for any questions about the guide process itself. Um, where are you stumbling? Where are you finding the most value? Where do you think we need to go next? Anything like that? Because I have a flow that I can keep following, but I'd love to you know, co-create this with you all. So I'd love to open this space up in case there's any questions at all about the process so far. Lauren. I'll just let you know where we are. We are still in the, um, how do we structure the land ownership agreements in the land trust? So we can't, it, it's like, we can't quite move forward on some of the other game guide things and how we're gonna move forward because we're, we're kind of in that place. Uh, so from a Finca Sagrada standpoint, uh, we are reaching out to some of our, um, like our Kinship Earth partners, et cetera. Um, but if there is someone in the group that is available to uh, talk with us about um, ideas so that we can simplify the structure for Walter and Susan and uh, get some preliminary agreements in place on just, just the basic ownership structure before we even move on, um, I'm just putting that out there. So I guess reach out to me. I'll put my, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, yeah, right now might be a good time for that because it seems like a very fundamental question. So can you actually illuminate on that question a little bit more as Anders? <clears throat> um, yeah, so Walter and Susan own Finca Sagrada 100%. They are in the process of putting the land in a legal entity. It's already, you know, drafted and on file. And their security for retirement, you know, they've got to be compensated at some point. So that there's preliminary discussions about how many plots of land might be available for uh, initial sale for um, partners to participate. Um, and then, you know, how much of that is, is designated for the retreat center and how, how we can make sure that they are protected in terms of their um, financial security while still staying involved. So it's it's very, very early, very basic, and we've been stumbling a little bit with that. Um, that one seems like a really good one to start next week. So if you wanna bring that one up and I can actually respond and we can unpack that a little bit more and I can present a few ways. And if anyone else here has models that they wanna share about how they kicked off, that'd be awesome. And then we can have next session be really focused on that because I think that is a preliminary place to start. And um, I guess I had made the assumption that a lot of those discussions had already taken place. <laughs> uh, right, and that was my thought. thought too, is like there's yeah. people and I'm seeing a note, you know, yeah, from Tucker, that there's a lot of wisdom in this group and we've been, we've been kind of going back and forth amongst our own circle and it's time to, to say, hey, we need help. Awesome. Then that would be a really good one to kick off next week because that is one of the, yeah, the very first questions you're doing is a lot of these are the very first stuff. I got to stop saying that. Um, but um, yeah, we'll kick that one off next week. Thank you, Lauren. And of course, please continue to collaborate and work throughout the week. So reach out to each other on Discord and stuff. Uh, Will and or Steven, whoever's got my hand up this time. You're freezing. So when internet uh -oh. comes... Um by saying that people wanted to move faster because that, that was the feedback I got from some of the Alliance members, not actually the projects. And now that we've heard from 12 of the 13 projects, there's a kind of a general consensus of Alliance. I just wanted to clear that up. Um, and also the reason I've raised my hand is to ask if there's a way to clearly show what working groups are forming in between each bi-weekly or weekly call we can just 
observe and see what working groups are forming, but also then decide whether we want to join them and participate. Um, as an immediate solution to that, we can use Discord. So in Discord itself, you come here, you can see all of the events here. So at the top, you see the events. Currently, the only event that's happening is the Region Civics Meetup all the time. It says when it's happening and you can join it and all that stuff. Uh, I know that Neil is able to set this up. So maybe he might be, and you can respond immediately if he would be, uh, set up a meeting and we can just add it here in the Discord for now. So say what the thing is and you can have it recurring. And the second track, we had talked about that forming too. You can also have it set up here. So if you wanna facilitate a second track, um, awesome. And then you can just have the event here and people can see it and you can make announcements and all that. Uh, so I know Discord's not a perfect tool, but it's what we're using now. And um, I think we just can keep making better use of it to coordinate um, until we find something better and the time to switch. Does that help, Will? Yeah, thank you, thank you. And Neil, did I speak for you? <laughs> Would you be willing to help? Yeah, if uh, you wanna just share in the ask anything thread, please give you event um, posting access to post recurring events. Then I'll just add you to the event moderators group. Awesome, thanks Neil. Um, Tucker. So my question is about uh, the tokenomics model. Um, so when talking about like tokenizing equity and working in terms of like real estate, uh, the question of value comes up, um, especially for like what types of actions we issue equity tokens for, uh, because in some of the models that we're kind of working up right now, it's very inherent that um, we will kind of start with a, an equity token amount that is kind of paired with the value of the property, but very quickly that value will decouple if we're going to be issuing equity tokens for all sorts of different behaviors. And so I was wondering if anybody had um, kind of thought about this a lot or come up with a solution for this type of an issue. Um, and if anybody is offering assistance in uh, helping us with our tokenomics model to come up with something a little bit more financially feasible. Um, if anyone has any reflections on that, please put your hand up. I can offer some though. Uh, the basic model behind the, the token equity is the idea that you're only issuing it if there was a contribution. So then under those theoretical assumptions, then the value of the whole project ought to be going up. So you ought not be uh, decreasing the value or really decoupling that under ideal circumstances. And of course, it never will actually be this way. Um, they're in parallel, meaning, you know, very simple. You got 2 million in land, you have 2 million tokens, great. But then you made a video and the video was really inspiring. You paid $5,000 to have that video made, okay? So $5,000 out. But that video maybe had 10 million views and got huge publicity. So now the project isn't just worth the land anymore. Now with all of this other social capital that was built because of that video, it's probably worth a whole lot more than the 5,000 you just paid out in equity tokens in order to you know, get that. Or maybe not, maybe the video is a total flop, right? And that's how it's gonna actually be you know, not perfect is you don't know the value of these contributions going forward. But what you're trying to do with governance is keep those things in balance. There's that equation, you know, kind of value in, value out. What is value? That's gonna be something different that each one of our projects determine. You know, some are gonna look at all the forms of capital and say they're all valuable and actually track spiritual capital. And I say spiritual because that's one of the ones that people find the least, you know, concrete and very hard to track. But if you're doing that well, then that's something that's actually being contributed to the project and you can track it. And maybe all you really need to do is just show the impact. So if you're tracking all of the value that's coming in for the tokens that you're issuing out, then anyone who's holding those tokens know what's happening. Like, okay, like we've issued more tokens, but we gained all this spiritual capital or cultural capital or whatever it is, right? So that's ideally what you're trying to do with tokenomics, potentially, you know, at least one ideal is you're issuing tokens only when there's a contribution. And under ideal circumstances, those contributions are creating more value than what we actually compensate or paid out. 
So ideally that video that came in synergized with the other value that was already there and became more valuable than the $5,000 or whatever you paid for it, right? Um, so this is gonna be, it's constantly refining. You know, how you determine value as a community, that's gonna be unique in every community. What proposals are being passed in your community are also gonna be unique in every community. Again, what I always, I'm just gonna keep saying this, it's just important that you make how these decisions are being made explicit. So as you understand how you're making them right now, then just make that clear. You know, we're making decisions and this, you know, happened in other organizations. It happens in all of them. They have to have this question. Um, but for example, you could come up as an organization and say, hey, we're only gonna track things that help our bottom line for the next three quarters or next quarter. So if we can't really track how it's gonna improve our sales over the next period, we're not gonna compensate anything outside of that. You know, you can have that side of the spectrum and that's fine, you know, just make that explicit. You know, some businesses operate under that, you know, philosophy and that's a very sound strategy and everyone who's running in that feels like that's a great idea. You know, or there's the other extreme where you're just giving tokens for anything. And, you know, that's not keeping a financially sustainable structure either. So all that being said is one, make it explicit what you're aiming for and two, just track things. So if you're tracking it, then you can continue to refine it. If you're not tracking it, then it's going to be very difficult to improve your system. So if you are a community that wants to, you know, give out tokens for spiritual contributions that are very hard, like someone did a, you know, meditation session and wished your project goodwill and love, like that's fantastic. You know, I'd probably like that as a project. I don't know. It's up for you, right? But you can actually track that and say, okay, well, we gained, you know, a meditation meditation session. And that's why we issued these tokens, right? Um, so as long as you're tracking what's happening, then you can continue refining it, which is going to have to be the answer because there is no right way of doing this. It's something that we're just going to have to learn and explore and find out what's best for us, right? Uh, was that helpful or how was that, Tucker? <laughs> yeah, that was uh, a bit helpful. I, I do want to take a second just to respond um, to bring up some more like specifics around it that we're still having questions on. Like, like one of the big questions is like, how do we fund the liquidation of equity when people need to do that? Obviously there's like, okay, if a community member is leaving and somebody else is joining, you know, that co person coming in could be basically just buying the equity off of the person that's leaving. But it's like, you know, there's always the, op the chance that somebody's gonna need to liquidate some of their equity and they're not, you know, fully liquidating all of it. So it's like, where, where do the funds for that come from if, we're issuing equity for things that aren't providing financial value, like spiritual contributions or something like that. So one of the models that we were kind of playing with was like, okay, well, what if we took like 20% of all of the community's revenue and put it in like a debt and equity fund and had some sort of like monthly or quarterly protocol that would allow us to like divvy up those funds to the people that needed to liquidate their equity. And so like, I'm curious how HIFA um, operates in this manner, like when you earn HIFA tokens, is there some sort of exchange protocol to like, you know, liquidate your equity or is it just like equity tokens that are just kind of always stuck in the organization, you know? And so like when we've been talking to some of the more like real estate and financial focused people that are interested in what we're doing with our community, um, very quickly, the question of, okay, well, if you're going to be issuing equity tokens for all sorts of things, now you have, say, the six. But now, a couple of years later, there's a million equity tokens, but you still have $600,000 worth of land. And it's like, are we just diluting people's equity that contributed financially with the people that are being issued equity tokens for their contributions? Or is there a way that we can sort of model that that allows people to still get their equity back if that's what they want to do? Ooh, so many good questions. Um, I'll respond one more. First, I don't know if it's helpful to call them equity tokens because they can be more than that. Um, second, you're not diluting financial investors if you're actually tracking contributions. Because then if they are actual contributions to the project, then you're not diluting anyone. You're gaining more value, right? Than the example of that video. Um, so it sounds like you might be a community and your current investors don't value spiritual capital. Ergo, I wouldn't suggest tracking that. I'm just assuming. I doubt you do or not. It doesn't matter. 
Um, so that's the first one is don't have a model where you are diluting people because that's not a sound model. That's gonna create problems always. So make sure you're only issuing tokens for a contribution, right? Uh, the second one is why do other people want these tokens? So that's one of the cool reasons about using tokens and not just using equity is you can build other reasons why this token is valuable. So one basic model that was presented in this alliance is to have your token be one, backed by all the assets of the project so that if it does fail or whatever, then everything's liquidated and those are given to token holders. So it's not equity. It's kind of as good as because it has that promise that should this fail, we're gonna sell everything and give it to the token holders. Okay, so, but this token needs to be used for a stay at the project. So every day anyone stays there, they need to have one of these tokens and it gets destroyed. So in this case, you have a token that has a burn rate. So it's not necessarily an equity token. It's a, it's a token that's backed by the value of the project. So it's kind of as good as equity, but um, it has other use cases in it. And if you have a burn rate, then you can actually show how many more you can issue regularly without actually inflating them. You might have a deflationary token, meaning if you have 30 rooms and you're burning 30 tokens a day, but you're only issuing 10 tokens a day for new contributions, then your project is losing 20 tokens every day. Or it could go the other way, right? So why other people want this token is one of the main questions you're asking as a community, is what are we creating? What value does this token hold for us? Maybe it's a token that needs to be burnt to stay at the community. Maybe it means something entirely different. Who knows? That's up for you as a community to kind of figure out. But that's a very basic question you're asking. Yeah, we're giving out this token for tracking contributions, but they need to cash out. Like, how? Why does anyone else want this token? Perfect question. That's what every you know token-based community is asking regularly. Um, so that's part of your tokenomics design. Again, I offered that basic one that this is like a rent stay token, because um, then how it works is that people who want to you know exchange work for the project in order to stay there, well, they earn one token a day at least and then they use it to stay there. People who don't wanna work because they have tons of money, great, well, they're buying tokens off the people who do. So they'll have to acquire the tokens some other way. So then that gives away for people who've earned the tokens, they'll sell those tokens to people who wanna stay at the project that don't wanna earn tokens another way, right? Um, so that's how that kind of circular economy can work is you have tokens that are being burned for staying at the project. Um, so does that, is that helpful, Tucker? Yeah, that's actually a, a really good feature, the, the token burning. I'm going to have to play with it a little bit to figure out how it'll work with our model, but I, I think that might have been one of the missing pieces. Probably not all of them, but definitely a big one. Awesome. Uh, and I, I'm assuming that's a future session, too, where I can do kind of like a basics to tokenomics. Um, I was going to put that in a different chapter, which was going to be focused more on the tokenomic design because, but I guess that really is part of, uh, yeah, okay, cool. So maybe that's part of next session. Um, if we get through Lauren and you bring it up, maybe that'll be the second half of next session. So we'll see if we can fit it in ASAP. Cool. Anders and then John, and that might be it for today. So I'm, I'm really curious. Like, I, I appreciate that spreadsheet that went around and you guys did a first, like, kind of like you guys got a first hit on, on that we're in, you know, who's in, who's like really in on this. And I think that just comes from a place of wanting to know, you know, like for you guys to know, like, where are we at as a collective? And, and I am like sitting here wondering, like, where is, where are all of these other projects at in the process specifically, you know, like what, which part are they working on? Which part do they have down? Which part would they maybe need help with? And so if we can collectively see, and Miro is like a great, you know, place potentially to, you know, have this in some type of way. And I know that sometimes putting ideas out is, it's, it's hard because maybe it's, I don't have the time to do it, but I'm saying like, for me, like if somebody knows Miro and we can put our different projects in there, we can kind of see where we're at and we can all go there. Then maybe as a collective, if we realize that seven out of our 12 projects or 10 out of our 12 or 13 projects all have a problem in this one specific area, then maybe that's where we need to focus our efforts. Because sometimes I think when I'm confused about something, I'll rather do the thing that I hate doing, which is my laundry. Right. But like I actually need to do the thing that I'm confused about, but I don't have the resources or the assets. And if I can connect with another project that has that thing down, 
then that would be like really good. But I don't know who's you know dealing with which parts of this project. Um, <clears throat> maybe I can put in a self-organization principle here or invitation to follow with Anders is every project an invitation to go and record yourself giving an overview of where you're currently at, what you have sound and solid, you know, what your current protocols are that you do know, how your project operates from what you do know, and then end it off with some of the biggest questions that you have. So kind of talk about your strengths and weaknesses, that basic process, right? But then also everything with multiple functions, this serves as one of the first videos for orientating you or orientating new members to your project. So you can start using this today when people wanna start contributing to what you're doing, they can watch this video and get a good idea of how you're operating and where you're at. Um, so this would kind of go over your game guide, it would go over your master plan. It's literally you know, what Nico just did today, but a little bit more detail. And then ending it off with, a, this is where we're currently at. You know, This is our biggest next step. You know, And these are the big questions and hurdles that we have. So if you kind of package that, then we can watch each one of the other projects. Simultaneously, we're gonna learn from what they do know, their strengths are, know what to reach out to them for. We'll also see their weaknesses. So if we do that in video form, I think that's a really great medium these days. Um, and it'll help us also take stock of where we're at. So the process of putting this video together too is gonna really help us understand where we're at in the whole process and where our gaps are. Um, I've seen some head nodding, so does that work? Awesome. Thanks, Anders. You're just bringing up all the great wisdom. Uh, John. Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to, to clarify, make sure I understood the gist of the, the conversation that you had back and forth with Tucker. Um, I had a, a similar conversation with Tucker last week about tokenomics and equity and um, that uh, one of the key ideas that I got out of that is that we can have multiple types of tokens. So a token that represents equity exchangeable for, you know, sellable in the market for, you know, owner in the, in the project does not necessarily convert into one that's a, a, a burning rate token that's for staying for residence on the, on the property, for example, so that we can create multiple types of token for acknowledging different kinds of contributions <clears throat> and for redeeming for specific elements of value in the in, in the, the project. Did I capture that? Okay, good. Um, you don't have, you can create multiple tokens, absolutely. The first question when you ever want to create a token is what is it used for? And speculation is a use case. Maybe it's not a great one, but whatever it exists, it's here. Um, so you can say we're creating a token for speculation. This token is only backed by the project should it fail. It's a speculative understanding of the value of the project. And the only use case for this token is it trades on the secondary market for people who want to bet on the success of this project or not. You know, that could be a very, that's a valid token use case. In fact, that's most of crypto today. Most of crypto is just a speculative use case on a community and a concept. You know, you look at Cardano, Ethereum, all of them, it's just speculating on the community size, right? <laughs> so that's a token use case, right? You can say that that's the function of our token. Again, none of this is bad, wrong, or whatever. I mean, that's up to you to decide. What's important is making it explicit. So when you create your tokens, you can say this token's explicit purpose is to help our community get value by making something that people can speculate on. And in doing so, we can issue more tokens and sell it into the market, and we can use that to fund our work. Okay. Again, that's literally what all the big crypto tokens are doing. They do exactly that. They issue more tokens to fund their network, and people speculate on the token price, and that funds all sorts of stuff, right? So you can say that. Um, or you want to make it more grounded and say, this is literally a security token. I think that would be a failure. I don't think making security tokens is really like a one-to-one -one complete solution. Uh, for some projects, it is, and I highly recommend it for some. Um, but I think we can do a lot better. Um, making another rent token, that's interesting, but... Again, I think we can do more interesting stuff and we can get into some of that later. So when you come up with like creating your economy, just think, what is the use case? What are we actually trying to accomplish with this token? And then you can design the token to accomplish that. So make it explicit. Finally, I'll say this again, because I know it's clear for some of you, if the only point of creating a token is to create something that can help drive financial value and to you know, speculate on, perfect. Say that that's the point of the token. 
um, give it some other utility and send it off. <laughs> you know, um, maybe there's some laws around that. Don't quote me. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm just talking about what's good for our communities and helping people understand what we're doing here. Um, was that helpful, John? Cool. Um, well, we just went over time, so we keep doing this. Um, maybe we can have just a quick question. Do you think we can go longer in these sessions? So we try to make them any longer, or do you think an hour and 15 is pretty much where we want to keep it? Anyone have any strong opinions on that? Anyway, we'll take it to Discord. We need to get more done faster. 90 minutes works for me. We might do 90 minutes because there's a whole lot that we keep trying to pack into these sessions. So maybe I'll put up that. Maybe we'll just start it next week and just start doing 90 minutes. And for those who want to keep on can do so. Um, but I want to leave room for one more question before we close today. Nope. Awesome. So to kind of wrap it all up, because I feel like I went everywhere today and shared a lot, please don't feel overwhelmed. I'm just kind of putting all of this out there so it can help inform how we're creating the DNA right now. But don't feel like all of this needs to happen right now. I know this can feel overwhelming. Um, what I'd really encourage you to focus on if you're feeling like, wow, there's just so much, is just focus on compiling what you currently have. So make that video that's showing like, this is where we're at. This is how currently things are running and operating and actually have a starting point to start building on top of because that creates all of the explicit agreements as best as you understand them today. And that gives us a base to grow off of. And then all the things that I keep bringing up that might be gaps in what you currently have, great, we can start filling that in as we go. Um, but that process of filling it in itself is what ought to be earning people tokens and what you could be acknowledging for. So why I'm bringing all of this up is because we do want to get the game going because the game itself is designing the game. So we don't want to design the whole game first because then we forgot to acknowledge all the people who helped us design the game. <laughs> or we have to just go back and do that again anyway. Okay, so that's a whole lot to share today. I love you all. Feel free to unmute your mics and say goodbye or whatever noises you'd like to make. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Ciao.